Hi, welcome to episode three, season two of the Tom Hotspur Family Podcast. Um, welcome to any new, new listeners and welcome to existing listeners. Um, for well, certainly for our existing list, listeners, you'll be familiar with the fact that we tend to do this, tend to record the podcast over Skype um, with people in different locations, different cities, different countries, continents even. Um, tonight, um, for one night only, um, this is a bit of an exception. Um, I'm here live um, in a room with some other people. Um, next to me is a voice that we've heard a few times before on the podcast, Nikki. Hi there. Um, and we've got two guests. So you are... Paul from Johannesburg. And and younger brother to Paul, Dean from Johannesburg. Um, it's a pleasure to have you. So we're live in Johannesburg. Um, and um, before we begin talking about the Leicester City game, just um, to get a little, little, find a little bit more info about our guests. So um, there's a question that um, Andrew Pelling um, has, has submitted some time back. I always ask um, new guests this question. Um, so if I start with you, Paul, um, how did you get bitten by the Tottenham bug? Probably in two words, um, a chap by the name of Glenn Hoddle, actually. Uh, yeah, I grew up in London, uh, um, sort of from the age of around seven till about 17. Um, yeah, he was my sort of idol, really. You know, I was playing a lot of soccer myself as a kid, and uh, he was the chap that I looked up to. And uh, I probably started supporting Tottenham in about, I don't know, it must have been about 77, 78, something like that. It's, it's, it's quite a few um, of our um, quite a few of our listeners and quite a few of the people who have taken part in the, in, in the podcast um, cite that as a reason. And, and, and Hoddle tends to be the name that, mm. um, uh, mm. player that seems to be sort of a fan's favourite. Um, Dean, what's your... Well, this is an easy one for me because uh, coming from a, um, a family of football crazy guys, uh, I was born in 78, which was pretty much when Paul started supporting them. And I don't think anybody else in my family had much of a chance. Paul just took me into, into the Spurs way of thinking. And I, I think I got an Everton shirt once when I was three or four. Um, but I don't know what happened to that actually and I just became from there on it was just Tottenham all the way it was burnt in the garden actually <laughs> probably was and um, yeah when I was old enough to appreciate what the players were doing the standout player for me at that stage was probably Paul Gascoigne or even a little bit before that could have been well Glenn Hoddle was still around yes. he was still playing when I was a, when I was um, supporting as a youngster and Chris Waddle was a fantastic player to watch um, but I think overall Gary Lineker took took uh, most of my attention whenever I was following following Tottenham I'd watch what Gary Lineker was doing. And am I right in thinking both of you, um, your father um, supported West Ham, is that correct? Yeah absolutely, he, he's a hammer through and through and still is yeah. um, as is one of our other brothers, there's four of us by the way, four brothers um, myself um, and Dean, oldest and youngest, and we've got uh, Lee, who's a, also a hammer, unfortunately, and Troy, who's a Man United supporter. And we'll stop the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and was there ever a temptation, you know, coming over to South Africa and spending thirty odd years here to follow, I don't know, Orlando Pirates or, or one of the local teams, or are you just Spurs through and through? Uh, never thought of supporting any other team other than Tottenham. And I have no, I, I have very little interest in the local football here, unfortunately. We, we were fortunate in the late eighties that um, the coverage was improving, and uh, we were able to watch quite a bit of it. So um, that definitely helped us to keep in touch. And 
No, there was no inclination to uh, change allegiance at all, <laughs> not in the slightest. Yeah, the, the football's very different. Mm. I mean, you can't yeah. even compare. It, watching, a, watching a local game and watching international football is two completely different games. It's funny how big soccer um, is in, in, in South Africa. I've mentioned it before on the podcast, I've, I've been to South Africa before, um, just for the benefit of, of, of the listeners. So... Um, three of us are wearing um, Tottenham, sh- um, top, Tottenham tops and um, when I was um, flying in this morning from Cape Town to, J- to Johannesburg, I was from Cape Town Airport and the amount of people that were stopping me, people in the airport, Tottenham Hotspur, I'm a <laughs> Liverpool fan and you know, um, it's, it's such a big deal I think here and particularly I think the Premier League, mm. um, which, is, which is nice. I think, I think Gareth Bale has done quite a bit for the exposure of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the club in South Africa over the last five years. I think mm. he's sort of taken us to a slightly different mm. Well, definitely when, when Tottenham came out for the, their last, almost, I wouldn't say their last, because let's hope they come out again, but their mm. most recent appearance in the local competition, uh, the Vodacom Cup, I think yeah. it is, or the Vodafone, something like that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, he'd had his cracking first season as, right. a, as, a, as a striker winger for Tottenham. Yeah. And when Harry moved him up from, from left back to left wing, and then they came out the following year, the year that they finished fourth and actually qualified for Champions League. So he's, yeah, Paul's right that mm. he himself he lifted the club. Huge exposure country. for yeah. us, wasn't it? Just, just on that, just, just before we talk about Leicester City, um, Nikki, briefly, you mentioned last week about some of the stuff you've been doing in, in South Africa, trying to raise the profile, whether that be um, indoctrinating nephews and nieces <laughs> and that sort of thing, but also working with a South African. How, how much of a um, football uh, Spurs uh, supporters club here, how much of a challenge is it in South Africa? We mentioned the Vodaf- uh, Vodafone Cup um, in 2011, and, and if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think that competition has survived, uh, survived. Mm. and I don't think Spurs have had a pre- presence since, since since then which and obviously we had players like Pinar in the past and um, how much of a challenge is it to to get Tottenham noticed in, in, in this country because the obvious thing is for, I suppose for people to support a Man U or a Liverpool or mm. something like that um, is it you know, what are the Actually, two questions. What, just on, on, on that, what are the challenges in terms of getting away from the profile? But also, we've just watched the, ga- the game together. What's, um, if you could describe a typical match day um, experience in South Africa, what, what, watching Spurs? It's a bit disconnected, isn't it? Mm. Mm, I, mean, it that, is, I think that's what Nikki's trying to sort of um, yeah. change. Yeah, um, there, there, are lots of, there are lots of supporters mm. um, around South Africa, and you'll often find, especially on Facebook, there are lots of small little groups with a handful of supporters or whatever, but there's no, there's no real camaraderie and, and there's no mm. sort of... Um, group that, that combines all the supporters, the supporters, that, you know, whether they're in Durban or Cape Town or, you know, Bloemfontein or Joburg, whatever the case is, there's nothing that kind of combines mm. them and makes them a unit. And, um, and I think that's what I'm trying to actually change because there are official supporter groups for South Africa. Um, there is one in particular, but, I, you know, they don't do very much and there's not much marketing around it. Um, the, the details on the Spurs website is inaccurate, actually. And uh, well, what year did we win the League Cup? We beat Chelsea. What year was 2008. that? Two thousand and eight. We had a gathering of note, didn't we? Um, yeah. How, how many Tottenham supporters were used? Would you say are were, were together that day? Well, we we filled a small restaurant. There must have been about a hundred. Yeah, hundred of That's us. There. Probably the biggest gathering of Tottenham supporters, apart from obviously the games that we've had when Tottenham have been out here. Um, the single biggest single gathering um, we've ever had, really. Um, yeah, that and the last time they were out here in the the Vodacom Challenge, um, Gary Mabbott was out, Clive Allen was out, yeah. and they hosted us. At a, at a restaurant just uh, adjacent to Ellis Park okay. um, and there was probably about 200 people there right. but that had massive coverage because the team were out here yeah. ah. so it's totally different to what Nikki's saying in that well it's just a weekend football game actually on this particular occasion the club were here they were playing 100 yards away at Ellis Park Stadium 
and we all wanted to see and hear what Gary Mabbitt had to say mm-hmm. and it was a fantastic afternoon but yeah, it would be fantastic if we could get you know a much bigger group of the supporters together for, yeah. for on a regular basis which but is that's the thing on the website you find a lot of people post on the mm. not on the website on the Facebook page a lot of people post and say okay so I'm in Cape Town just survived where can I watch the game or I'm in Durban just arrived where can I watch the game and and mm-hmm. Joburg so and the problem is that there isn't anywhere that you can actually say to them and, I, and that's what I want to change because by, by creating a, an official supporters club in South Africa I want to then combine all the smaller groups and and enable them to give me information of where they're going to watch the game so that we can just publicize it more and get the get the following a bit uh, uh, you know better because unfortunately you know, everybody supports Man United, mm. and it's just, it's boring. You almost need, like, one unified place, for example, let's just say in Johannesburg, a bar or somewhere, a bit like in New York, they have a bar called O'Cassie's, which is a Spurs bar, yeah. um, where you can just get people together in, in one place. So, at the moment, what's your, um, how do you follow Spurs on what, for, for a live game? Because in the UK, um, if you don't go to a game or don't, whether it's home or away. Um, if it's televised, then that's fine. Then you can watch it. And normally, um, one of the satellite channels or cable channels, so that's either Sky or BT, will cover it. But that assumes that you've subscribed and, and paid. Mm. Um, but that's only if that game is covered as part of their live um, live um, ga- game. So quite often, like uh, for example, the, the Leicester City game, that would have been streamed online. And quite often, the experience in the UK is you're scrambling around trying to find an internet link that's working and that's good quality and doesn't um, buffer and whatever. Um, what's the typical match day experience in South Africa? The games televised generally? We, Absolutely. Yeah, we have to say that um, Super Sport and DSTV have, have signed it up. Um, mm. we, we get all the games, we get over, well, I don't know how many games there are that we've seen. I think in a yeah, season we might miss two or three. Two or three. Yeah. Otherwise, we get. They, every, would, they won't be the Premiership games. They'll be the the, the lower league. You know, other other cups, other other competitions. Couple, one couple. Yeah, yeah, I think we've probably got every single Premiership. Every game. Every single yeah. Premiership game will be we, covered. Yeah, we even get all of the Europa games as yeah. well. Mm-hmm. It's um, only we. It's this year we only we only couldn't do one game, and I think that was think Burnley um, Capital One. Yeah, over Christmas. Which, which, which yeah, interesting. Which wasn't mm, even yeah. televised in in the UK. That's correct. So yeah. yeah. So we actually very really fortunate. Brilliant. We're very lucky. So for us, a, a typical match day is, you know, if it's a Saturday, Paul plays golf in the morning, and Do you um, get your nails done or something. I get my nails done or something. <laughs> in contrast to that, though, there's very little coverage from in, in terms of live streaming. So even if the game's on and you you're you're out of the house and you can't watch the game because it's a very garden outdoors environment in South Africa. We're, we're garden people, we like to get out and sometimes we don't always get to watch the game. Um, you can't you can't find it online, you can't stream it from somewhere. I don't know if you guys have had the same experience. No, but I play my life around yeah. so I'm always in the lounge over there <laughs> very, very, watching yeah. the game. <laughs> so very, very difficult to tune into a, a stream and, mm. and watch the game online. So now all we need is um, a team that actually starts winning some games. So, um, talking of which, though, we played Leicester. Um, that's now uh, two points accumulated out of nine. Um, I'm really going to quickly just summarise sort of my take on it before going around. Um, I thought, I actually thought the result was was fine. I think it was disappointing conceding a goal when we did um, so soon after. Um, I thought the I thought a draw was. Incredible result, and I think Leicester are actually the best team that we've played so far. I don't think United were particularly good, and I don't think we deserved uh, to come away there with, with nothing. I think Stoke City came alive in the last few minutes of that match, um, and we allowed them to do that. I think Leicester were, were a good team, but the fact is we've still only got two points, and really disappointing the way we played. Um, standout performance for me, and we'll, we'll talk about this fellow a little bit more was Dembele um, I've slated Dembele on previous podcasts I'm not he, he frustrates me I can see all the good that he does but he just frustrates me in his final delivery I thought he was our best player on the pitch um, but phew, I'm despondent um, Paul what's two, your yeah, two, two games on the trot to, to give away a lead like that is really frustrating so um, I, I hear what you're saying about the result 
um, being credible, um, but very disappointed that we've squandered um, a lead, you know, two, two games on the trot. Yeah, Dembele was great. I thought he played very well in the first half. Um, he got a bit tired at the end, didn't he? I think that's why he probably was taken off and replaced. Um, he'd run out of steam. Um, it was nice to see Chadley deliver a nice ball for the goal. Um, we were talking about it during the game, and we were saying that he, he pops up and does stuff, which is important. It's not the sort of guy you can drag off, whereas Lamella, on the other hand, for me, is a, a, another frustration. I just don't know how long we can persevere with him, quite frankly. Um, yeah, um, Leicester, credit to them, good team. Definitely agree with you in the first half. They're the best team that we've played so far in the first half. Mm. I felt that they fell away for the first 20 minutes of the second half. And then we almost woke them up um, and we, we gave it away stupidly. I mean, the, the concentration straight after scoring should be at its highest level and it wasn't. So I'm, I'm not happy. <laughs> I don't think any of us are. No, very disappointing. Um, and to go from such a high to such a low in such mm. a short period of time um, is not devastating, but it's not very pleasant either. Um, I thought that we were, you know, you've got to take into consideration that we're playing the top team of the table. I know it doesn't mean much this early in the season, but they're on a roll. We're not on a roll. We have played Stoke and we've played Man United, so not easy games. Uh, and I think it could have been a different game if we'd had Ericsson. Um, and I certainly think we shouldn't have had Lamella on. Um, we've got guys like Tom Carroll and we've got guys like uh, Delhi Ali, who came on and got the, the goal for us, um, that we, we could also have tried out. So uh, frustrating to watch Lamella not know what he's doing when he gets the ball. Um, he's a little bit of a mess, actually. Um, he, he finds himself in front of people, between people, blocking the flow of play. I uh, just wasn't very impressed with him today. Um, I had three standout players, maybe four in fact. Um, I thought, although we didn't hear his name that much today, the new signing Toby Alderweireld, I thought he was class. And I think a good, a good sign that a player is class is that he, he never got himself into too much trouble, that his name was mentioned by the, the commentators that much. Very tidy, good in the air, um, I think cool, calm and collected. Um, unfortunately, it just seemed as though it wasn't Vertonghen's day. Everything Leicester threw at us came down Vertonghen's channel and Ben Davis. Um, I was surprised that Vardy didn't take greater advantage. What well, should I say, was he not more of a threat than he actually was? Because Vardy tore into us last time around. Memory's not so good, I can't remember if he scored or, or whatnot, but the games I've watched where that guy has performed, he's been prolific. Um, the other players that stood out for me, definitely second half, Harry Kane turned the game for Spurs. Yeah. We looked like a non-entity in the first half, even though Leicester didn't perform to their best. But Harry Kane switched it on in the second half and he, he just drove through players. You know, the amount of tackles that he rides and... I think he gets a bit lucky that the ball bounces back off of his foot and he pushes through and it, it falls back into his stride, but he's a big, strong guy. And I think that's his style. And I think if you can't stop him, you're in trouble. Um, and Dembele was fantastic. And I think I mentioned to Kyle Walker, he sprints up and he's just improving every game. He, he flies up the wing, delivered a great ball in from the right. I can't remember who was on the end. Chadley, Chadley, Chadley was Chadley on the through, end yeah. there. Um, and... He was unlucky against Man United, but the ground that guy covers and the speed and the gift that he has, I think uh, he, he was also deserves a mention today. Everybody else, very mediocre performance. Yeah, it was. It, it, yeah. I was saying it earlier, you know, um, for Tongan, for me, just he needs to catch a wake up, honestly, because that guy, he's so frustrating. And yes, maybe he did have a bit of a tough game today and everything was coming his way but but also he's played enough games and he's supposed to be better than what he is you know it's almost like he's just not interested there's just a lack of something with him and also I think that um, yeah it's the beginning of the season but Poch's last last season all we spoke about was Poch's training methods mm. and how the guys are training extra to get match fits and all the rest of it 
Granted, only the third game, but they are not match fit, nowhere near. They are getting tired. And and the, the fact that they were so happy, and I understand that they're happy that Ali scored because it was brilliant and it was just, it was such good teamwork between Chadley and, and everybody was focused on Kane and for Ali to be there and, and get the goal, wonderful, great. But then they lose perspective and, and they're able to catch us on the break. I still find that the game is slow and predictable. We just, we just don't chase them fast mm. enough and we don't catch them on the break and we're just too predictable. Still, same old Spurs. We don't have enough pace in, in our team um, at the moment. We've got, we signed this guy, Clint, called Clinton Nji, or Ninja, um, and... I can see that's his name moving forward clearly. Ninja. <laughs> Ninja. Um, <laughs> and I don't know... I, I hope he's quicker than a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> um, it wouldn't take much for him to be quicker than any of the current 11. We, we don't have any pace. That's a really big issue. So you've got Kane, but there's nobody that run, runs beyond Kane. Um, Chadley occasionally, but there's very little... And then, like you say, when we... When we it's ironic because when I watch... Um, Spurs what was commentary in, in, in the UK and uh, listening to other, other podcasts and listening to the so-called experts quite often Kerry Kane gets accused of lacking pace now that might be true but w- w- whenever we do break away he's got momentum he carries the ball mm. forward really well but we don't have anybody else that's got natural pace um, Chadley maybe up to a point but it's Even like Lamella look, looks laboured. Too many of them look laboured. Um, Lamella looks like he's going to fall over yeah. at, mm. uh, every turn, doesn't he? Um, he's like a chicken without a head. But yeah, Harry's pace is, I would say, better than average, but not exceptional. Yeah. Um, Chadley is the same. He's not exceptional, but he's not slow, you know? Yeah. Um, but you're right, we, we need somebody with that, with that spark that Lennon used mm. to give us. Mm. We're missing that, and Bale, obviously. Um, so I wonder if that's not where we need to add to the team sort of before the window closes in the next 10 days or whatever. Um, that's probably priority. I, th- I think on that point, I'd th- throw a name into that and say, where, where is what, what's going on with Andros Townsend? The guy's fast. Yeah, he is fast. He's faster than... Fast, but he's a one-trick pony. He he's, he's runs, shoots, runs, shoots. There isn't much more cut comes on, in on his left. Which I suppose is the same with Lennon, who was our only other pacey outlet, was he was a one-trick pony as well. I said, I said to Nicky before, you know, with, with Andros Townsend, I like him, he's a good player, don't get me wrong, but when he's played for England, he's often played against quite weak international teams, where he's got quite a lot of space and he's able to do his thing. Yeah. In the Premiership, you haven't got the time to do that, so he can't quite dazzle and, and um, impress the way that he might have done for England. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I don't know if Andros is the is the answer. Unfortunately, mm. as much as I'd uh, like to be wrong. Berahino, we've been linked <coughs> with Berahino, and mm. he's got pace. Um, obviously, he brings goals. Um, well, he scores goals at, uh, at West Brom, and if he does come over to Spurs, I hope that he carries that form with him and doesn't end up one of these players like Soldado that loses his way but he's also got pace um, Niji um, no, I know very little about him other than what I've seen well, they talk about him having a fair bit of pace yeah. in him so yeah. I think the bottom line is it's about time a couple of really good decisions were made in addition to Alderweireld which was a mm. good one it's about time we made some really good signings somebody needs to take ownership of that and make sure it works this mm. time because we've had to put up with quite a lot of rubbish over the last two years since we sold Gareth Bale mm. That's my feeling. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, um, I'm just concerned because when I saw the when I saw the um, lineup and and who Potch had chosen, I mean, I was just like, oh, come on, there are other people to choose from, for goodness sake. I mean, I don't particularly. Yeah, he, he was okay once or twice or you know today, but I don't particularly rate Davies. I would. You know, and I know a lot of people don't like Rose, but yeah. I actually like Rose, and I think mm. that that's what we needed today, a bit of spark mm. from Rose. It gives us a lot more going forward, and he links up very well with Chadley. Um, just on Lamella, because we, we mentioned him earlier, look, last week he, ca- he came on with 30 minutes to go, and I, I was at the game, and um, the lady who was standing next to me, Rebecca Braddock, who's, who's appeared a few times on the podcast before, um, she said to me, and... Uh, and said, oh, you know, it's last chance saloon. Not last chance saloon, but here's, he's got 30 minutes to um, 
to prove that he's worthy of a place in the lineup. Now today he got some people before the game were because Ericsson hasn't played well. Um, I'd, I'd read were suggesting that Lamella should start in the centre in, in, in place of Ericsson. As it was by default, he got that opportunity because Ericsson was injured. He played for an hour this time. He didn't come on come on at the 60 minute. He played for a full hour, and yet again he didn't take that opportunity. And Clearly, technically, he's good, or he had something at Roma, otherwise we wouldn't have paid the money that we have. But I just... I want... A bit like Soldado, you want to believe that it's going to happen. But the more time passes, I can't see it. I just... <clears throat> yeah, I, I think there was more chance of Soldado coming right for us, um, or getting it right, than, than there is for Lamilla. Um, you know, he's young, he's inexperienced to a point... And uh, he does look like a chicken without a head, unfortunately. Um, you know, I'm not sure he'll, he'll easily sort that out by himself. <laughs> La- last season was an interesting season, though. Our, our defence let us down, um, but I commented during the game earlier. I said, if we're going to play with one player up front, we need to have three midfielders behind him who can all score is equally as well. Okay? Last season, that happened. Um, I heard a stat that we were one of two clubs that had only three players score into the double figures, and the other club was Manchester City. So this season, I wouldn't say that we're all too bad. I mean, yeah, we're two points out of nine, three games down. But if we can get Chadley, Eriksson and Harry Kane scoring into the double <coughs> figures, with Harry Kane you know, to start, fingers crossed, as soon as possible and get up to 20 goals, because if he gets to 20, he should get to 30. I think Chadley's capable of getting 10, Ericsson getting 10. Then we're scoring as many as we did last season. And we finished fifth. The only problem is the other teams scored just as many past us as we scored past them. Yeah. So I think Alderweireld is a good signing. I think that will help calm things down in the back because I think we're still a bit jittery at the back. Um, and I th- It's disappointing that we've started off slowly and we've only got a draw, two draws so far. Mm. Yeah, we've got to take some pressure off Harry, though. There's no doubt about that, right? I mean, he's he's the lone striker, right? So we need backup. I think uh, you mentioned that, Jeff. Um, so maybe instead of having Harry score 20 or more than 20, let's have Harry score in 15 and a new guy score in 12. And then you've got Ericsson and, and Chadley backing that up. Yeah. I mean, that, that would be, I think, first prize, would well, it not? Uh, it's know? a spread, uh, spread around a bit. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. right now we're, we're relying on one guy. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and the problem is that because they know that he's our goal scorer, they all target him, and Absolutely. that was clearly mm-hmm. evident no, when, no, when man, Chadley's ball mm-hmm. came over. I mean, there they were, all around Harry, and they completely forgot about Ellie behind him, you know, mm. so... That's the thing. I think I think people have sort of worked him out, and, and they're trying to modify what he does. And, that, and that's fine, and that's that's expected. And all the good strikers um, will once they start to get marked, and it's actually it'll, it'll be a, a measure of how good a footballer Kane is, how he's going to deal with that second season syndrome, how he's going to deal. I think to be honest, I think from what I can see, I think he'll be fine. I think he'll draw players in. That will create space. At the moment, nobody's exploiting that space. Mm-hmm. Now, hopefully, someone like a Barry, you know, for example, will, will, will be able to exploit that. Well, perhaps an example of that was the goal that we scored today. Yeah, you know, um, but no question. And it was Deli Ali obviously making that run. Absolutely. Yeah, young exactly. player, lots of energy, mm. um, fresh legs. I think with you, yeah. you uh, Deanie said that he. I said he had energy and obviously fresh legs, but he also had. I think mean, the words he used were purpose. Yeah, desire. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, brave goal, wasn't it? We, got his head down. Yeah, very brave. It was a good goal. Yeah. He, he kind of knew where he needed to fit in, which was mm. the big problem with Lamella yeah, the yeah. whole game long. Uh, well, like Lamella was blocking and stopping passing. Would, would Lamella have got into that position and, and nodded yeah. it away with his head? Absolutely not. Mm. No. No. Yeah. Definitely not. And then it comes back to nobody was running past Kane until that fella came on. And that's what happened. So. Let's hope so some some positives to take out from, out of the yeah. game, definitely, <clears throat> but frustrating though. I think the, the biggest thing was just lo- allowing them to score so soon so after. So few, uh, literally seconds after. For I'm, I'm sake. devastated with Fatongan. I really, I, like mm. Nicky said earlier, he's better than that. He is better than um, that. And uh, he might not be captain, but he, he's you know he's one of the captains on the pitch with Walker and uh, obviously Larice. You know, he's one of the more senior guys. Mm. You can't 
make that kind of a, a mistake. And lack of concentration, that it, that's what it was for yeah. me. Unacceptable. And a really good finish, though. I mean, mm. the guy's on fire for Leicester. Yeah. It's a com- again, Huge it's like typical yeah. Tottenham Hotspur, the way it happens for us. <laughs> is the best always beats us, in it, but it always happens to us. Mm. The best strike, the best little quick jinxy move, it will, it'll catch us out yeah. where it won't catch out United or <laughs> Chelsea. So um, we've got now, as I said, we're beginning to two points from a possible nine. Now, in terms of in terms of results, um, in terms of uh, well, comparing it to say 2012-2013 AVB's first season, we had three games there, and we lost the first one to Newcastle away, and then we drew the next two, um, which uh, bizarrely were two home games on a trot. Um, so we had the same points tally. Yeah, I know that season we had bail, and that obviously was a big factor. But I, there was a period of time from about December to March where we were unbeaten. We accumulated a lot of points. Mm-hmm. I'm not suggesting we're going to do the same this year, but you can just as easily start the season well. I think last year, as I recall, in the, in the season before, um, we started <coughs> the season well. But that doesn't necessarily mean doesn't anything. Mean. It's early days. It's, it's three games played. Um, it's just frustrating as a Tottenham supporter. Yeah. That, that happens I mean it's just because obviously you want to see your team win and you want to you know you, you just you want to see better things from them I mean if it's a really really tough game and you draw well you know you take away from it that it's a tough game and like you know yes Man United were pretty average and that was, it was a pity that that they actually won with with the sort of own goal but um, and and uh, yeah Stokes Stokes a tough team but mm. you know we came at them and, and they woke up like you were saying today, Dean, yes, this was probably all you, Jav, I forget, but um, yeah, it was our first sort of test today in terms of they, they're on fire, Leicester, you know, they're, they're playing pretty well um, and, and they did challenge us. It's just, it's just a pity that we lacked the concentration and, and our defence just... You know what, three games, we've done a lot right. We actually have done a hell of a lot right. Let's not lose sight of that. You know, we were unfortunate against United. There was a lot of good stuff in that game. Stoke, as you well know, we were great for three quarters of the game yeah. and then threw it away. So there's lots of positives. Mm-hmm. Today, you know, we held, we held, we held. I think I heard somebody say just before half time or just after half time that it was a little bit frustrating that we weren't going forward enough. But at that point, it was nil nil and we were sort of consolidating. And then we got our goal. Yeah, after that. should have been it. it. End of story. Thank you. Away win, snatch the goal. Yeah. Done deal. I know. But you no, said, we, we, you no, said, I, I we just need to hold on for two minutes. And when said, you said that, I, I wanted to shut you up really I fast. I shouldn't have said that. I was, I was asking for trouble. <laughs> that, that was a big mistake. Yes, I like the minute you said that, I thought, oh, I no. <laughs> but p- bottom line is, a lot of positives from three games. So two points, yes, maybe out of nine, but... So you think Potch is going to stay, Levy's not going to get itchy and Look, fire him? No, <laughs> I think there, there are a few things we need to iron out. One is the fitness. I think there are a few players who don't seem, Ben Lab, for instance, Mason, okay, he's had an injury, um, that don't seem fully fit. Harry Kane, maybe the a long season last year and then playing with the under-21. So there are a few, few players that, for whatever reason, they're not fully fit. That, sometimes that happens with prof- I know it's ridiculous but sometimes there are some professional footballers that don't kick on until September or October it's almost like a distraction yeah um, so there's the, we need to obviously iron, iron that out um, we do this every season we don't get our signings in in time um, and I think we just need that transfer window to be over and done with that out of the way for two reasons one to kill the tireless endless speculation because once it happens once it's over it's over that's it and but and, all, and the obvious reason just to get some quality players in and yeah. get them embedded and Daniel will stop messing around 25 million do the deal get the guy in finished you know what I mean and then we've got our, our partner for Harry Kane you know I mean I would imagine that 25 million is available to spend right yes or no I would think so I would say, yeah. Um, yeah. And again, I think this, the, the new the new scout or head scout is Paul, Paul Mitchell. Mitchell yeah. Paul Mitchell. Mm. I think he's got. I think he's got to show us what he can do, yeah. because Alderweireld was known to everyone. He played a fantastic season at Southampton, who were rock solid at the back. Um, so him, think Deli Ali might have come through the Mitchell. I don't know. Yeah, Deli Ali, I think came through through Mitchell, but uh, a lot's been said about him, and we've seen him today, and he scored a goal. Great, 
let's see him half half a season in, okay, and, and make a, a judgment again then. Um, but I look back three, four years ago when when Harry Redknapp was the manager, we didn't have all, much more money to spend then because we hadn't had the Gareth Bale money yet. And Harry was able to pull in players like Scott Parker. And I think that if we had Scott Parker now, if he was three or four years younger, playing for us like he did three or four years ago, I think he's better than Ben Taleb and better than Ryan Mason. So I understand that there's youth coming through and those are two two young guys that we need to see strengthen and grow and develop their game. But I, I think that this Paul Mitchell guy, as, as well as he's renowned for finding new young talent, we need Daniel Levy to find somebody like Bastian Schweinsteiger who came to United for for a steal. Look, he's at, towards the end of his career. But that kind of player, mm. I think... So what do, you, what do you... Okay, on that very note, talking of young English players, what do you think about Dyer in the holding role, holding midfielder? Well, I was... Yeah, I was just going to get on to that. I think that he had a relatively good game today. Um, but also having, having said that, Leicester played for 80% of that game with 11 players behind the ball. So was he that pressured? Mm. Was he that pressured? They weren't attacking him that he really had to block his defenders in front of him. Um, they were clearly trying to attack on the break Leicester, but I think it was the weather and the heat. They weren't able to do that as well as they would have liked to, but that was their game plan. Stay out. We've got Vardy. He's lightning quick. Um, we've got Vertonghen. We don't know too much about Alderweireld, how quick he is, but uh, Vardy's fast. So let's try and get Spurs on the break. They're going to try and come at us. Um, they don't have enough points on the board yet. But So would you persevere with Dyer as the holding midfielder, given that he can get forward and score with his head? Would you persevere? I can see maybe where Poch is going with this thing. I can see it's worth a try, but I wouldn't risk it now. Mm. I wouldn't do it at this stage of the season. I think we need to get points behind us. Or we, need, we need to get into our stride. Um, and I would much prefer to have Dyer as an alternative to Vertonghen, perhaps. I would even possibly play Vertonghen as a holding midfielder. Because he looked, I mean, he got up the left wing yeah. and he has scored from advanced position in the past. I think it's, you know, it could be worth a try. Mm. I think the trouble with Vertonghen is he's quite stubborn and he likes the idea of playing as a centre back. Yeah. And we, when you put him out, for example, out of position and get him playing left back, which by the way he does for the national team, Belgium yeah. national team. Yeah. He seems to throw a bit of a sulk. Uh, I, I think, think Dyer does a good job in that role. I think he's a good player, but he's a utility player who can play that role. But long term, I don't think he's a, he's a solution. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, look, I think that Dyer is great for the future for us. I think he's a he's in the Michael Dawson frame of things, but I think he can be as good as Ledley King. Maybe not as good, maybe not quite as good as Ledley King, but anybody who can get near to Ledley King is a, is a decent player. Mm. I think he's young, he's big, he's tall, he's fast. He had a great um, debut goal against West Ham. We've seen him play on the right wing when Kyle Walker was injured for most of last season. He is quick. Uh, we saw Vardy just nip past him when he got his yellow card towards the end of the game. But I think he's faster than Vertonghen. He's mm. bigger, stronger, and I think he's a bit... Um, what's the word? It's not fearless. It's not braver. But there's something about Dyer that would have perhaps stopped that goal. Mm. He would have closed that gap quicker than Vertonghen would have. I think we've got to find the right position for Dyer. I think he has a place in that team. I think it could future, be. Definitely. It, it could be next to Alderweireld. Mm, but then be. what do we do with, with Vertonghen? Play him at left back. Yeah. <laughs> I've said that a few <laughs> times. Yeah. Yeah. Or left midfield. I think Vertonghen could be quite effective as an attacking left-sided midfielder. Yeah. I think it'd be very effective. He just needs to get his head out of his ass. Mm. <laughs> yeah. anyway. uh, look, you know what? He's made a few over the last year or two. There's no doubt that Fatongan has made some silly mistakes in that central position, which has cost us against Arsenal. I seem to remember him slipping or something. I can't remember. Mm. You know, I think he should be a left-sided player, more offensive. That's where, that's where we would get the most out of Fatongan. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you know, 
He just, he, to me, he just seems a bit complacent. Maybe a bit too. He's got this image of being very cool, super cool. Mm, yeah. It's almost as if he's too cool, too lackadaisical, just not focused enough. Whereas, mm. as you were saying earlier, Alderweireld really looks solid, um, yeah. and that, that's. Did you uh, notice how um, Vertonghen uh, got forward at the end of the game? Mm. I think I thought it was actually Harry Kane, but it was. Yeah. I can believe it was Vertonghen. Yeah, you know, he put in a little the cross. cross yeah. You know, that's. I think where he could be the strongest for us, going down that left side. He's not slow for Tonga, eh? Well, you know, he scored a couple of seasons back. He, he hit two past Man United, if he I'm did. not mistaken. Yeah. Relatively so, so why, impressive Why are we messing well? around with a guy that perhaps is a better offensive player who's actually right now making mistakes at the back? Mm. Doesn't yeah. make sense to me. You know, yeah. Alderweireld looks good, yeah. you know. Maybe Dyer, maybe we're selling Fazio too quickly. I don't know, but you know, well, we've got Kevin Wimmer to Kevin test Wimmer. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And the he new looks boy good. from Cologne. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's time to move for Tongan to a more offensive position. I'd rather have him going forward than worry about what he does at the back. Anyway, um, okay. So second half of the podcast, we're going we're to go for a few questions and we'll briefly look at the Everton game and I'll go around and get some predictions Um, but first before I do um, as ever here is Elliot Line with the forward line this is the forward line on the Tottenham Hotspur family podcast with me Elliot Line looking forward to the game against Everton on August the 29th last season we won this fixture 2-1 coming from behind with goals from Ericsson and Soldado in fact Everton haven't beaten us at the lane since 2008 I rate the likelihood of us scoring is 72%, and of us scoring more than once is 34%, and of keeping a clean sheet is 49%. The most likely scoreline is a 1 0 Spurs win, followed by a 1 1 draw, a 2 0 win, and a 0 0 draw. Overall, I have 51% for a Spurs win, 28% for a draw, and 21% for an Everton win. This has been the forward line with Elliot Line. Come on, you Spurs. Okay, welcome back. Thank you, Elliot. Um, so, turning to that Everton match. Um, so it's, it's a week today at White Hart Lane. We've got a very good um, record against Everton at White Hart Lane. I think they've beaten us once. Um, Lost four or five. 2008. 2008, that's right. Oh, yeah. I think it was, yeah. Um, before I give my prediction, or to ask you for predictions, I should just say that um, as much as obviously as Spurs fans, we want to win that match and get get three points on, on the board. Um, straight after that game, that's it. There's going to be an international break. So if we start to if we think that we're going to start to build some momentum, no, it's not, not going to happen. happen. No. Um, but anyway, that's just part and parcel. So um, yeah, every club's going to go through that. So. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. true. Um, Dean, what's your prediction for the game? Can we finally get three points on the board? I think we can. Um, I think Lib- Everton are one of those sides where they can either be really shocking or they can have a really good game. Um, they have been shocking this season already and then they came out and they thumped somebody 3-0 last week. Um, but I think Everton, there it's a case of keeping one, two players quiet. Uh, Lukaku's on a roll. I think Alderweireld needs to do, do a job on him. Um, and of course you've always got to watch out for for Ross Barkley Um, I think if either one of those two has an off game I think it's there for us to take control and I think we can score two goals I think we can get two goals it's just about how how does Vertonghen play (laughs) Um, I'm going to go for a 3-1 actually okay I'm going to go for 3-1 well me, Miss Optimist, always Spurs are always going to win. So next week we're going to lose because then it means we're going to win. So <laughs> no, no. the reverse um, psychology. <laughs> well, at least go for the draw. We, we try. We try. Uh, well, we're going to be at home. Um, are you going to the game, Joe? Yep. Are you? Okay. Um, well, I don't know. I just, I just think that if hopefully Lamela doesn't play. And, you know, and I just hope that we are able to get um, Rose on board. I do. I just I, I like Rose, and I just like to see what he's capable of. Because going forward, I think that he, you know, he's got a lot to offer. So I'm going to go for probably because 
Unfortunately, I don't think our defence is good enough yet that we're going to keep clean sheets. Mm, yeah, so I think we're probably going to go... F- I'll go f- with a 2-1 win. 2-1. Paul? Yeah. Cool. yeah, I think a lot depends on Ericsson's situation. Hopefully he's not too badly injured. Um, if he doesn't play... You know, that's tricky because we, we're lacking a playmaker. Um, so I, I guess I'm going to give you two predictions. If Ericsson plays, I think we'll win comfortably. If he's not playing, anything could happen. Mm. Well, Everton, it's funny, they're one of these clubs where they, they did this under David Moyes. They have one good season, followed by one bad season, followed by one good season. So two years ago, when Martinez took over, they had a good season. Um, they qualified for the Europa and then it seems that when they're in the Euro- Europa the following season their league form suffers so last year they didn't have a good season this year they've started off I don't know if they play I don't think they play today I think they play tomorrow yeah, so but they've done okay so far mm-hmm. um, the lad Stone the mm. defender Chelsea are, are after him that obviously might unsettle the team but, but they seem to be doing well I think it'll be a really tough game I think it'll be a close game mm. the thing one thing about Everton is they're not Stoke City they won't come to White Hart Lane and um, try to shut up sh- shop and, and try to catch us on the break they will actually catch us on the break but they won't um, they'll be open they'll be open yeah and yes. they'll allow us opportunities and I think we're going to exploit that and like Nicky says um, a few weeks ago, actually, I would have probably said, yeah, we're going to win 2-0 because we've got our defence sorted out. But at the moment, we just, based on the season, we seem to be conceding a goal every game. So <coughs> I'd say a repeat of last season's result, which was 2-1, and I think, yeah, 2-1. Might just steal it. Yeah. Um, we need a win. Even if it's before the international break, we need a win. Well, I, th- I think um, we've got guys that are playing for their England spots. Harry Kane's very capable of getting two goals on his own. Um, Chadley can get a goal. If Ericsson's back, he can get a goal. Harry needs Ericsson. They link up so well. They do. Two, eh? and they if they're together, we've got a good chance. Yeah, but we, we <coughs> saw Harry Kane today break through two or three times in that second half. Yeah. And as Nicky said earlier in the podcast, he takes players with him now because he's that profile of player, which could leave somebody like Dembele, who may have a new lease of life, to have a few cracks from just outside the box. It was certainly good to see him have two nice shots today, wasn't yeah. it? Even though they didn't go in, they were on target. Yeah. yeah. Pre- preempted a question I'm going to ask in a minute. So, moving on to questions. Paul Simon asked, Dembele looks half the player he was last season, in brackets, in a good way. I'm referring to he's lost some weight, I presume. Mm. Actually, he's clearly been working, working, working hard to get fit over the summer break. Does this show a new keener attitude, and what should we expect of him this season? Oh, I, think I think his intent is very clear to see, and, and it's nice to see Poch actually having faith in him and putting him in. Putting him in. Um, he's a confidence player, there's no doubt about it. Uh, he's looking fit and trim, great. Confidence is building, he's had a few shots today. I'm hopeful that he's going to improve even more, and then he could be a really important player for us this year. Yeah, agreed. Um, but I do think it's about which position we we choose to play him in. Um, I, th- I still think there's a big question mark over that. When the team sheets came up um, earlier today, they had Dembele out on the out on the right wing yeah. to start. Well, he cut in from the right, didn't he? Then a couple of shots. You, you're going to think that he's going to cut in, and Kyle Walker's going to overlap as, as he does and bombing down the right. Um, but he. he I think it was AVB that tried him once or Tim Sherwood tried him as a number 10 one or two games in a row because he had that ability to be strong on the ball, hold it up and, 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 and stand his ground in the, in the box and maybe um, get a shot off. But he's clearly the, the most comfortable running at players and he's, he doesn't, yes, he is skillful. I mean, the ball never runs away from his feet, but he, he bombards and, and he um, just bashes his way through players and I think um, if he if he gets that right it's going to break for him the only problem is the last couple of seasons he's been trying that too much and he doesn't get his shots off so mm. it could improve I think but maybe we need to try him in different positions um, I, I said at the ass I'm not his biggest fan but I thought he did really well today um, I think it that's a really good point about where he plays in the team. It's really crucial that he, for me that he plays in the centre, whether that's in the number 10 role, in the Ericsson role, 
or even as one of the two midfield players in the Bentalab Mason role. He's got to be in the centre. What concerns me, although he did really well on the right today, what concerns me is, will he cutting in, but will he, will, if he keeps doing that, mm. will he track back and provide cover for um, and help out Walker in the way that, for instance, Chadley does on the left-hand side? That's the only thing tactically about that, but um, he... He did really well today, so um, and I think he did just then. I think he did just that in the first twenty minutes. He, he was, was he was tired today. He was watching Walker's back. Yeah, in the first half. He worked and, hard today, did Miller. Yeah. You know, he was he was very effective. Well, but he, he had to come off. He was finished. For, for <laughs> me, he he did the job of two players. Two players should have been doing that today, and none of the other players were rising to the occasion. Possibly because um, they had um, Eric Dyer sitting back. They all thought that they were a bit safe and they had a bit more time and they were a little bit less, um, you know, uh, the, the, the drive or, and the speed of thought wasn't quite there. And I think that was frustrating because Lamella wasn't doing anything and Dembele had to do it all himself. So he got the ball and he was driving. Every run, every attack mm-hmm. that I saw coming through the middle of the park came from Dembele. Do you not agree that... The, the, the balance, that's, that's the word we're sort mm. of looking for here, um, of having Dembele and Eriksen together is a, is a nice combo. If you look at the Man United game, uh, albeit that we were unlucky, and the Stoke game and how effective we were for sort of 60 minutes or 70 minutes, that was the dembele Eriksen combo, mm. right? Mm. I mean, isn't that the nucleus of what we need to have? Obviously with Harry and then well supported you know, behind with perhaps Dyer. Well, yeah, and then I'm looking at the blend and the balance of the team, that's what I'm trying to get at here. And I just think that so far we've touched on the best combo of Dembele and Eriksen. Well, you know what you were saying earlier about a couple of our players being too lightweight. Mm. Okay, I think Eriksen is a bit of a lightweight, but he more than makes up with, with his intelligence and his runs mm. and what he's able to do with the ball. Absolutely. So I think you've got it spot on the mark. I think Dembele is the battering ram to, to Ericsson's creativity and finesse. And I think the two of them in the team at the same time Works. gives Ericsson protection and allows Dembele to come up with something special because too, too many people are, are watching Ericsson maybe. So they have that... It's a good balance. It's a good balance, yeah. You know, and that's what it's all about is getting the balance right isn't it and the other thing is if Dembele can hold the ball up we, I mean we hardly ever see him standing still with it he's always running and carrying the ball but it's quite likely that he's also the and I use a rugby term the impact player the crash ball player where he'll take it into the first tackle the guy will either bounce off or, or Dembele will roll him he'll stop there and he'll have Ericsson run through and take it off of his toe and continue the run or Chadley or Chadley yeah so I think Dembele is that crash ball player. So moving along, we've got a question from two questions, similar questions. So Zach Gesnola asks, how much game time do you expect to see from Delhi, Ali and Pritchard before Christmas? Um, he suspects they might have to force their way in via the Europa like Kane and Mason. And similar sort of question, Kevin Kirk asks, should we play our fringe players or substitute players for the Europa or give them exposure or, or, or give them a exposure to, competi- to competition and b keep them match fit. Well, um. well, look. I mean, come on. We haven't even seen or heard of Pritchard mm. at all. Another, yeah. You know, it's like when you mention his name. Oh, 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 yeah. We have him too because mm. he's just nowhere to be seen. So I don't know if he's being saved for the other competitions or whatever the case may be. I think after today's performance. I think it's very clear that he needs to give Ali a chance because the guy is willing to take opportunities and show his worth. He's going to fight for his spot, I Mm. think, um, like Kane did. Um, As for the other players, you know, I just... And I said this last last week, um, I'm so fed up with, with our usual lineup where these guys are just far too complacent and I, I mm. honestly think it shouldn't be a given for some of them that they should even be starting mm. I think they need competition they need somebody to come in and say hang on a sec I want this position and I'm going to fight for it and these guys as a result need to fight for it I, th- I think the Europa League was fantastic for Harry Kane but only because he was a striker and I think a, str- a striking role if you if you get goals you get better 
And I think he got the goals he needed in Europa to springboard himself into the Premier League. Okay. I don't, however, believe that for midfielders and young, exciting midfielders, playing in Europa is a good thing. Mm. Because I think midfielders, by virtue of the fact that they don't score as many goals as strikers do, I think they need to be thrown into the deep end to see how good they are because they play in the middle of the park. I think a striker needs to bed himself in, get his confidence up, and, and the lower leagues and the the, the, the less um, or the lower competitions like Europa and what they have done for Harry Kane, getting him into that position and getting his momentum going was fantastic. But Pritchard, Delhi Ali, I think those guys need to be given an, a shot in the Premier League. Mm. You don't play them against mm. Chelsea, you don't play them against United or Liverpool, but you stick them in there when they're playing against Leicester or they're playing against. Um, or play them in the first half and then bring, yeah. on, bring on Ericsson yeah. like I think they need as, as the sort of uh, the impact player. yeah so so blood them in sort of in that way because I think that it'll be a Thursday night and we'll fly 12,000 kilometers or whatever to somewhere in Kazakhstan and play under an inch of ice Pritch, Pritchard and and Ali will will get kicked around yeah and they'll be sliding everywhere and the standard of football isn't where it is that those guys can show what they're made of. So Premier League for them, please. Yeah. And the guys that need confidence and need to score goals, throw them into the home Europa League games. Mm. Mm. Yeah, even the boy that came on today, what was his name? Ali. Ali. No, the Carol. other one. Carol. 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 Yeah. There's another one that perhaps should start a game instead mm. of maybe Mason. Well, yes, you know, um, just to give him a chance to prove himself. Well, you know, he, he, how else are you going to find out if these guys have got it what it takes? I, I think I think Tom Carroll completed a full season on loan at QPR last season. So although QPR were playing championship, mm. championships not easy. And I mean, we can yeah. see there's not much of a, a Bournemouth have just come up, mm. and they're playing some good football, and they won again today. So, so Tom, you've got Tom Carroll. Um, Pritchard, who's just signed a long-term contract. I think Carroll has as well. Deli Alley, we've just signed. Quite a lot of those players. There's another one, Harry Winks. Yep. Th- these are players which Poch has shown some faith in. So I think at some point, sooner rather than later, we are going to see... I, they, he probably won't throw them all in at once, but I can see... I mean, Deli Alley's, you're right, he's, he's shown not just by his goal today, but by his enthusiasm, by his... I don't give a shit attitude. I, you know, bravery, should we call it? You know, just I'm going to go there and and try something new. Whereas you contrast that with Lamella, who's also a young player, but there's all, he's almost playing as though he's trying too hard. He's mm. he just doesn't have the confidence. Where these are these young players, much like Harry Kane last season and Mason, they've got that fearlessness about about them I'm going to try something different I, you know, I do believe you pull it off or not I just want to say supporting what you're saying um, today was a perfect opportunity for Poch to to give one of the youngsters a try like yeah. um, um, Carol for example yeah. instead of Lamella or Mason mm. a couple of lightweights mm. who haven't quite been delivering I think it would have been a real opportunity today to, to give one of the youngsters a first time start it's a pity it didn't happen in my opinion um, so we've got another question from Oliver Lease, um, talking of, of, of one of our other young, youngish stars, but more established. So he's, Oliver asks, do you think that Harry Kane will stay one of our own for a long time into the future, or do you see him moving to another club within a few years, not necessarily this year, but along with the, along the same lines? Which of our current crop of young talent do you think will stick with Spurs in the long run, and who who do you think might piss off to somewhere else <laughs> well, we sort of address the the, the other um, talent Let, let's just deal directly with Kane is he, is he going to stick around for the long haul I believe he's a Tottenham player through and through mm. I don't think that he'll mm. go anywhere else I think I think you know the thing is with Kane if he sticks with Tottenham and, and he becomes this goal scoring machine that we know that he is he's going to get the reputation of of you know and, and, we, and he gets us into Champions League, you know, we are going to then see him as our hero and he's going to become a, a Glenn Hoddle and a Gascon and all of those guys, the, the big name guys that you remember, he's going to become one of those for Tottenham. And I would rather be a big name for Tottenham than be a small name for another team, in my opinion. I just, mm. I just think that um, the guy has got too much love for, for the shirt. Mm-hmm. 
I don't think um, I don't think Harry Kane's going to have his head turned. I think he's a he's a Tottenham boy through. Uh, the the two players I'm worried about are Ericsson and this might come as a surprise to you, Kyle Walker. I think a lot of clubs envy Kyle Walker. I think he's he's a fantastic player. He's in the past he's not come back and defended as well as he has done. Uh, and he's centred his game more around attacking and, and shirked his defensive responsibilities. Mm. I think he's come back from injury, uh, and, and when he did so, Tottenham as a group played better because we had width and we had pace suddenly. What did we have last year? Carl, Carl Norton. We was had Carl Norton. We did have Eric <laughs> Dyer, Dyer came in for a game or two. Um, we have a right back now. We have a right back, but I'm worried about Ericsson is as good as anybody in the Premier League and Kyle Walker's got to be the fastest player in the Premier League who can attack and defend. But having said that, I, I just don't believe that Kyle Walker would leave Tottenham. I think he's a Tottenham boy too. Oh, I can see it in his face when he plays. The passion is yeah, there, the desire right. is there, the pride captain. is there. He's potential captain, actually. On the pitch, but you know. well, maybe we don't we don't know much about Kyle Walker, do we? I mean, what what do we know about our own players? We used to know a lot about Michael Dawson because he was vocal. We used to know a lot about Ledley King because he was vocal. Um, and we've had players that we we kind of we could understand what kind of a person they were on and off the field. Right now, I don't see any other than Ericsson that I've seen do a couple of interviews who himself is very. Reserved. Sort of reserved, okay. There aren't any personalities in that Tottenham side that are outspoken yeah. or that represent the club from an energetic level. There aren't any leaders, and that's no. where you wanted somebody. When we went that, when they equalised, you wanted somebody to rally the troops. There was no, there's nobody. Lloris maybe, but he's in goal. Um, you mentioned Carl Walker. I think. I think Mason for me shows a bit of tenacity, but no, none of the there isn't somebody in the. Um, There's no personalities. There. Graham Roberts mould, yeah. or, or, or I'm trying to think of other clubs. Um, Roy Keane, for example, yeah. at Man United. There isn't somebody that can. Well, there's uh, the, the, yeah. the person who I'm not going to mention, but who plays um, for Chelsea, um, the mm, their defender. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. 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 Look, has got some leadership qualities but he's gone off the boil you know and he's, he's having a bit of a wake-up call right now which is a pity so i think you're right stick the armband on kyle walker yeah, i would because he's aggressive we see him he doesn't take shit sorry it's a family show but uh <laughs> he doesn't take it and he gives it out and it can be a little bit dirty and i've seen a couple of spitting incidences where i don't know if it was him or the other guy but you know what? He's he's the loudest character there, and yep. and I like him, yep. and I think he's the type of player who could could get irritated with other players not living up to their standard, and he could move on. Exactly. And for me, I don't know many other uh, the Man City guys, maybe the Chelsea guys. There's no other defenders, I think that uh, you know have the have the the pace mm -hmm. of Kyle Walker, and the aggression. Yeah, we, we do well to hang on to him, definitely, mm -hmm. no doubt. So, um, a more sort of um, generic or broader question, nothing to do with the here and now. Paul Simon asks, who is your favourite Spurs player from history and how much would they be worth in today's market? <laughs> so you've said Glenn Hoddle, mm -hmm. so if you were going to value him, Paul, sure. in today's... Well, gee, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? But I mean... You know, he, he was such a different type of player as well. You know, you, you could say the same about Matt Letizia. I mean, they were just magicians, you know. Um, and uh, you don't you don't really have too many of those kind of players nowadays, actually. When I think carefully about what we've got in the Premiership, um, how would I value Glenn Hoddle right now? Probably right up there in the sort of fifty million and mm. plus. You know, definitely not less than fifty million. Okay. Glenn Hoddle at his best. Yeah. I think he's a superstar. Anyway, the hmm. tough question because there's there's just so many of them. You know, I, I said Gary Lineker earlier. What would you value him at? That would be an interesting one. Well, he would be upwards of fifty million because he was a goal a game striker. I think when he played for any team he played for, the it was one nil before the whistle had started. That was the kind of player that he was. 
Um, Would we be in the market for a Gary Lineker today? And when we signed Gary Lineker at the time, <laughs> he was playing for Barcelona, yeah. and we signed him. Um, for, I can't remember how many million it was. It might even even be less than two. Yeah. But if the equivalent of Gary Lineker, if Lineker was playing today, um, at that point when he was whatever he was, twenty eight, twenty nine. Um, would we be even able to purchase a player of that quality? Um, I don't think so. And I'm not going to say that he was he's my best player mm. because I think strikers that can get within 70-80% as good as Gary Lilica was, I think what Spurs really require now is a either a, a Davy Ginola or a Chris Waddle, and I used to watch Chris Waddle when I was when I was a, a, um, a youngster. He used to have the most ungainly stride and run. He looked the most uncomfortable footballer, but he moved at pace. He got past players, and when he couldn't, he could thump it from thirty yards into the top corner. And we don't. I haven't seen anybody but Gareth Bale do that for years in any team. And Gareth Bale even did that cu- cutting in and taking it on his left foot or cutting in and shooting on his right. Whereas Waddle was very much an out and out right winger and he would smack it from, you know, from way out wide right with his right foot and it would sail into the top corner. Um, I think he would have to be probably my best player. What would you value? And I would value him probably say 40, 45. I suppose it's difficult with today's market. When you said Hoddle at fifty, I would have said no. Well, I would have said less. I would have said no. I would have said no less than thirty. But the trouble is, it's just so. It's very difficult because some sometimes, particularly with English players, that they're overpriced. Mm. So, I never watched Hoddle in his peak. That's why. You, that's why you're saying thirty and not fifty. I saw him. At the, <laughs> I saw him at the tail end of his career. Uh, um, as player manager for Swindon and yeah. for Chelsea, and I've seen clips of him okay. in the past. I've never seen him. There, there is a in, in there is some footage. There's, there's a there's a half an hour um, feature of his best goals. Try and get it and watch that. Then you'll know what I'm talking about, mm-hmm. and everybody else listening <laughs> to as well. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable footballer, balance, grace. The ability to pick a pass from anywhere and also stick it in the top corner from anywhere. I mean, his debut for England, I'll never forget it, against Belgium. You know, half volley outside the box, places it half volley in the top right hand corner yeah. on his debut. Cool as a cucumber. Unbelievable. Yeah. One of the things about Hoddle that I, I did like, both, as I said, I only caught the latter part of his career, but I've, I've watched a lot of um, videos, clips yeah. from. from uh, the past, um, he was quite, he was two footed. He, he could he could, yeah. and that thing that really frustrates me with modern football it is that they are predominantly one. G- um, David Ginola was two footed as well to the point where I saw him take free kicks, penalties, and corners with either foot, mm-hmm. and that's quite something because you can be two footed during um, open play mm-hmm. where you're, you're forced in a situation where you have to go on your weaker foot. Okay, and some even the ones that are two footed. Um, will be able to deal with that scenario okay but when it comes to a dead ball situation they'll always go for their natural foot yes. Ginola would happily I saw, saw him t- try either because he had that confidence and he had that ability and it really annoys me when um, who was it last week Dembele coming full circle back to him but there was a there was a, <laughs> there was a situation where um, we, against Stoke he had the ball and I think I could be wrong but I think they had equalised by this point and he was out on the right, and he was he had the ball, and if he had the ability to shoot or the confidence to shoot with his right foot, he would have taken it. But he cut inside on his left. Um, Harry Kane today, there was an opportunity where he was out. out the ball came to him on, on, on the left hand side, and he shot straight away. And Ericsson did this a few weeks ago as well on their weaker foot. And that's what I like football is doing. I hate it when they have to cut in onto their weaker foot. And by the time they do, it slows the play down. Um, Nikki, I, I know you've been following Spurs um, uh, for the last well, maybe 10 years or so. So in, in, in that period of time, is there a standout player? I know who you're going to say, Bale, I guess. Oh, yeah, because I love Bale. <laughs> no, I do love Bale. I think that he's excellent, but I don't like Bale because he, he left us, broke my heart and made me look like a fool in front of 
um, their nephew came because I said to him that Bale would not leave. So for that reason, I don't like Bale. But <laughs> um, but yeah, um, you know, no one really that sort of makes me go, oh God, we need that person back. You know, if we could get Bale back, would I take him back? I don't know. I don't think he would fit into Potch's style of play right now. Mm. So, you know... I don't think that I would take him. And he's already valued anyway at whatever he's valued at. Yeah, exactly. Um, so on on that note, I don't think Spurs can attract a Lineker type player mm. for forty five million pounds in that in that predatory upfront striker. It's option. a bit of a concern, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a worrying situation. Whereas back in the day, we could attract a, a, a Lineker, you know, um, or that, or even a. I don't know if you'd say Klinsman in the same sort of yeah. in the same sentence. Um, you know, can we actually go to market right now and bring in a fifty million pound right. player to complement this existing team? Have we got not, what it? Given not unless we're in the Champions League, hmm. and not unless we're willing to pay that money. And the stadium, obviously, yeah. is important to us right now. That's probably priorities. Putting the new We're stadium. We're probably up. five years minimum away from being able to, to do that. sign somebody for fifty million to so knock them in like that. Bottom line is what we're saying around the table is we're going to have to be a bit patient over the next few years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's frustrating. But I was saying, I was saying to Nicky earlier today, <laughs> um, if you look at Tottenham over the last five seasons, I think it is we finished in the top six for. Well, actually, we finished top five. Top, top five. five. The only the only time that we didn't was um, that season where Sherwood, where we yeah, was getting and finished sixth. Which you know, six is respectable. We finished fourth, fifth, fourth, fifth, sixth, and then fifth. Okay, so that's six. Sorry, six seasons on on the trot. Um, we've never done that. You've got to go back to the beginning of the nineteen sixties. Mm. Over, you know, even in even in the eighties when we, we won trophies and we had um, Hoddle and Ardiles and Archibald and Crook, Crooks and all of these players, and you know that was a good period of time. Um, over a s- sustained period of six years, that's quite something. Um, that in itself is an achievement. So I think it's going to be steady progress going mm. forward, and we've just got to be patient. And but it's frustrating. That's the thing. It's frustrating when. Um, We've we're just outside that Champions League, and we just need the spot, and we just need to push that bit more. But I've got a question for you, Jeff. Um, I mean, I haven't lived in London obviously since the late eighties. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm a bit out of touch in terms of the the following of Tottenham. But we've got a sixty one thousand seater stadium going up, which is yeah. unbelievably exciting. From, from no building work's been done, by the way. Sorry, there's been no building work done at the moment. There are. Um, they're just digging up, but there, there isn't anything that hasn't been constructed. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, but ultimately, over the next two, three years, we're going to have a 61,000 seater stadium. Yeah. So, my question to you is are we going to fill it every week? Um, yes, I think. I mean, it's a good question, but I think, I think if the prices are. In, in other words, are we going to achieve the revenues? That we want to achieve out of the project mm. in the I long think, term. Okay, so we've, Levy's been quite shrewd with the um, NFL franchise, sure. and, and I think that will bring in revenue. Mm. Um, and but in terms of match day revenue, Tottenham Hotspur revenue, I think it's ultimately going to be dictated by price. Now, from what I gather, the price top, of seats. Price of seats. Okay. Yeah. So from what I gather, the Tottenham Hotspur supporters tr- um, trust. Um, we have cap law and Martin Cloak um, last season on the podcast they've been working closely with the with the club and looking at pricing okay mm-hmm. so okay. the signs are encouraging but whether that actually manifests itself I don't know but mm-hmm. that's going to have a big impact um, the other factor is just going to be how we how we fare on the pitch at the end sure. of the day irrespective of price if you know even if the club charged through the roof if the product on, on, on the pitch is good, people are going to come and it's, it's, it's supply and demand. People are going to come and pay up to a certain point. Mm. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of um, um, people who are on the waiting list for for season, tickets. For season yeah. tickets. So I I actually don't think that there's going to be an issue with filling the stadium at all because I just think there are that many people that would like to. And if but, Kat and, and Martin are able, from the Tottenham Hotspur, uh, Hotspur Sporters Trust, are able to do and achieve what they're busy working towards, and that's keeping the pricing down of the tickets, I don't think there's going to be an issue at all. I, I do have a concern, because 
<laughs> and I don't want to sully the conversation by mentioning those others, the Woolwich Wanderers in the library. <laughs> but when I watched them playing against West Ham on the first day of the season, the library had many open seats. And that's a, what, 58, something yeah. around about there? When I was looking in the, in the stands, they weren't filling that stadium. And that was a home game, and that was a London derby. And so they'd supposedly had a great, well, they did have a great pre-season, and they, they, they picked up silverware. You would have thought that everybody would be in that stadium and pack it. But do you not think it's because of the timing of when the season starts? I mean, that's their summer. That's pe- a lot of people are on holiday mm. in August. It's just a, a tricky time. A lot of people are away at that time of the yeah. of the year. I but, would just but, think that people are on holiday. Mm. Well, I'm not making excuses, but that's just my thought. Arsenal fans are inbred. Um, yes, a bit like <laughs> yes. Stoke City fans last week. So um, I wouldn't judge judge how they. Whether they feel the, the one that the only thing that concerns me is on Europa nights mm. and some of the cup mm. games. I think you were the uh, Paul and Nicky with the Nottingham Forest cup game yeah, last great. year. Big night, that was great, wasn't it? Mm. But, yeah. but I don't correct me if I'm wrong. But was the stadium particularly packed that night? Um, it felt pretty full. It did but, but feel pretty full. Cool, but, uh, but I think we were so team. focused on the game, we didn't actually take note of, the, especially where the the season ticket seats are. Oh. I don't think we really took note but of. Who at was the there. moment, I think if there's 36 rounds on allocation, and obviously some of that is away fans. Um, but for the Europa games, they don't sell out that much. Um, which is one of the reasons why the cl- club reduces the price for those games, and it's quite quite good when they do that. I suppose some of that is down to the fact that they're middle of the week games, mm. and so that has an impact. I, I don't. I think ultimately it will come down to two things. One is the products on on the pitch, which we no one's got any control. Well, it's difficult to we keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, keep our fingers <laughs> crossed. And and the other thing is is, is the pricing. Um, mm. And if if the prices are such that it's not going to drive away fans and the club get it right yes. then you'll get the fans in you'll get the revenue in the product on the pitch hopefully will be good and we'll be able to buy a 50 million room and then we'll be able to buy a 50 million pound strike we eventually got there there we go um, <laughs> so it's a five year plan <laughs> yeah. um, but well maybe four <laughs> Um, we'll have to make do with the £25 million pound striker in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, so um, I haven't got... Um, apologies if, uh, if I've not read out um, your questions. We did have a few questions which um, um, we shall endeavour to answer in maybe next week's pod or, or c- coming weeks. Um, this one I'd just like to say thank you, um, Dean. It's been a pleasure for you to be on the podcast. Um, thank you as ever, Nikki. Thank you, of course, Paul and allowing me to... Um, it's host this podcast um, in your in your house. Um, yeah, it's, it's a first, isn't it? Mate? Yeah, it's been good. First fun. of the South African podcast, fantastic! It's been great having you here, Jeff. Thank you very much. Action. And on that note, the future's bright. The future's Lily White. Good night. in the dirt. Now gather around and sing it out and we'll talk